So very warm welcome to everybody who is joining us today. Um, let me just stop the transcription because that is very off-putting. I am Rachel Williamson, Head of Policy and External Affairs at the Charleston Institute of Housing and a member of the Women's Housing Forum Steering Group. And I'm really pleased that we're able to put on this session this morning, uh, or this afternoon even now, on women and professionalism. We've got lots of people signed up to either join us in person or watch it back, which is great. And we've got some brilliant speakers. Just a bit of background on Chartered Institute of Housing with the professional body for people who work in housing and the home of professional standards, which you might have seen has been a particularly um, big uh, topic of conversation recently. So we're going to dig into that a bit. And the Women's Housing Forum uh, is designed to raise awareness of the links between women's housing needs and gender inequality and to encourage social housing providers and partners to work together to tackle these issues. So in today's session, we're going to be exploring how women can be supported by their organisations and colleagues to develop their careers, balancing competing priorities and challenges. And as part of that, we'll look at uh, CIH's professional standards, qualifications and training and the role that that can play. We've got some really great speakers with us today. I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Sarah Dunkley, who's our Director of Professional Development at CIH. Sandra Maguire, Neighbourhood Operations Manager at Moat, and Trish Harrington, Workplace Services Manager at Abbey uh, Housing Association. And uh, what we'll do is we're going to hear from each of the speakers. Some of them have got slides. Uh, then we'll have some Q&A at the end. But please do feel free to be posting any questions as you go. There's a Q&A function as well as a chat function. So uh, you can see which works best for you. And uh, as I say, at the end, there is an opportunity if you want to come on and ask your question directly. If you just raise your hand, then I can unmute you. Um, the session will finish by 1.30, so we've got just under an hour uh, and we're recording this, so we'll be able to share it afterwards uh, and follow up offline with anything that it would be useful to talk about a bit further. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand you over now to Sarah, who's going to come on screen and share her slides. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to see so many of you here. I'm just going to um, get my slides up and I can make a start. Thank you. Yes. So, um, yeah, really, really pleased to be here today to be able to talk about this subject very close to my heart, probably very close to, to a lot of other people's hearts as well. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time um, just looking at from a, from a broader learning and development professionalism um, point of view, the sort of direction of travel and some expectations of of, of what could happen in the future. Um, just as a starting point, then a little bit about um, CIH and um, the professional standards or qualifications, um, obviously touching on the uh, the bill and uh, developments there, um, to, just to set the scene really. And then um, I will pass over to Sandra and Trisha, who are going to talk um, much more from a sort of personal point of view in terms of their own experiences, which will really bring it to life. So, so it should be really, really interesting. So. Um, I'll make a start. So, um, so where are we now? So, just thinking about when I was thinking about this um, this session, thinking about okay, so we've had lots of changes. Um, we're still kind of going through some of those changes, I think. Um, and life and work and all of those things will continue to evolve over time in a number of different ways. So. I think when one of the key things um, when that we now realise is that work-life balance is much better understood. We've all experienced, hopefully, good work-life balance, what that can mean, what it means in practice, how we can make it work um, and have more flexibility from that point of view. Flexibility is absolutely key. I think that's what people are now looking for from their, their work and their career journey to enable us to be able to um, balance lots of different competing priorities and do um, a good job across all of those, across all of those areas or as good a job as we can. So we've moved towards hybrid approaches. So we have lots of um, lots of activities now where we've got people joining remotely, people in rooms together, combinations of those, people working from home some days a week, all of those sort of things that we know we know very well. Um, but obviously, we also have to be really aware that hybrid approaches aren't suitable for everybody in every role. If you're a uh, customer facing and, and there's an expectation that um, a customer can contact the organisation between nine and five, then there's still that there's still that requirement there. 
if you're going into somebody's home to do a repair, etc., obviously you can't do that from home at the moment. Um, so there's lots of different things that all the individuals within organisations, within teams and also organisations are juggling all at the same time at the moment to try and make that work as effectively as possible, while also still being fair and I suppose and, and having a fair approach to um, to staff. Um, I think it's key now from a lot of the stuff that I've I've been reading recently that employees are now looking for career development as a key employer benefit. It's looking employees are much more in the driving seat in terms of requirements of jobs, um, what the expectations are, what the benefits will be, have what the flexibility will be, all of those sort of um, areas. So, um, so certainly I think that is a shift actually in the last um, few years um, from that point of view. And employers need to be very aware of that and and work with employees to to um, to meet that requirement. I think probably over the longer term, there's been a shift from a leadership point of view from taskmaster to advocate. So it used to be the case that a, um, a team leader, a manager of a team would be focusing on productivity, workflow, uh, making sure that the job was done. I think there's been quite a big move there. Still, that's really all really important, but it's also about being an advocate for individuals in the team, the team itself, making sure the rest of the organisation and more broadly understands and, and values the work that, that people do um, and understands the work that people do. So I think that has been quite a significant shift there in a number of different areas. And then the other thing, I think there's a lot of um, discussion about particularly on the L&D side, is around skills skills gaps. So where are the skills gaps now? Um, and where will they be in the future? So obviously technology is a big one. The implementation of um, artificial intelligence um, is raised, the profile of that is being raised in all sorts of areas, but, and particularly around um, professional development activities, qualifications, training, et cetera. But then also within the sector, we've got aspects around um, um, net zero, building safety. All you know, there's there's always new new areas of work that are coming on that we need to be updated on and keep aware of. So in terms of the direction of travel, um, and looking at the sort of areas that might develop in the future, there's a number of different things I think. So digital skills is a huge area, um, and is something that's, that lots of people are talking about at the moment and there's there's particular aspects of that that are that are can be challenging so for for leaders and managers who might have worked in organizations for quite a long time there's probably less reliance now on PA support on on-site IT if you're working from home or working remotely you don't have that you can't just pick up the phone and call somebody to come over and have a look at your computer for you um the other end of the spectrum is school leavers school leavers are all very much tuned into tablets and um, phone functionality, not necessarily so much necessarily on Word and Excel and all of those lovely packages that we use on a daily basis. So there's there's aspects there to consider. Because of the um, the um, expansion of remote working and um, people moving around quite a lot, then there are increased risks from cybersecurity. And I think that's something that's sort of coming to the fore at the moment as well, um, in terms of organisational skills in, in managing that, ensuring that everybody within the organisation understands the risks um, of providing information. The, I mean, technology is, is, a, is a huge area um, and sort of talking about it from an AI point of view. I think the the expectations of technology now are a lot higher, but I think there's still a there's still a consideration at the moment that empathy and cre creativity will still be needed. So we might want to rely on, or we might be happier to rely on technology to help us with cancer diagnosis, for example. But you've still got that the um, the empathy and creativity you expect from a doctor to to talk you through the. Um, the, the you know the options for treatment etc so um that is that is um i think developing quite a lot i think there's always this there seems to be in the in this the um the research that i've done quite a lot of expectation that 
and um, we will always need that. I think it's an interesting area because I think you know somebody of my generation would because we're used to that face to face contact. Um, but I don't um, in future generations that we seem to be moving away from that a little bit. So it'll be interesting to see. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, EDI is critical. Obviously, it goes through goes through everything that we uh, that we look at and talk about as an organisation, how we operate. Um, if we're looking at things like artificial intelligence to help us up, help us with work in the future, then we need to be really aware of that to make sure that the the data that goes into the development of that is representative and and um, represents diversity as we need it to, and re and reflects that appropriately. Um, the way culture in, is defined in organisations is changing as well. So it used to be that people would have water cooler moments, they'd have ad hoc meetings, they'd be able to catch up with each other um, in the in the office. And there needs to be more structure around that now if people are in different places to be able to pull that together and available at different times. Um, of course, talented people are no longer constrained by where they live. So we certainly at CIH have, have recruited people that we probably wouldn't have done previously um, who live in Northumberland or other beautiful places in the country and um, we've been able to access that that talent um, and that is the same across the board and retaining talent is key that goes without saying really once you've got good people in place then you want to be able to um, develop them and make sure that they stay with you and provide flexible learning opportunities as possible much more move towards sort of bite-sized training, just-in-time training, if you like, for particular areas of work. So hopefully that gives you a, a bit of a flavour of um, the sort of L&D landscape more broadly. So from CIH point of view, in terms of how we encapsulate that in, a, in our professional member, I think there are four four key areas really that, that fits into. So we have our code of conduct and code of ethics. We have a complaints process for people where there might be breaches of those and professional standards committee to oversee that. And there's an explicit requirement for all members to sign up to those codes. So making sure that behaviours and conduct within the workplace are appropriate. Professional behaviours, knowledge and skills is the second area of that. We have a set of professional standards around, around behaviours, so integrity, advocacy, um, not being knowledgeable in your job, all of those things. And we also have um, qualifications and training around the knowledge and skills aspect. And that's another key area, I think, of being a professional member of CIH, but also a professional member of, um, of, of the housing sector. <laughs> Obviously, there is a move with the um, the new bill going through Parliament to look at mandatory qualifications in some areas for some roles at level four and level five. We have been in discussion with government about that. We understand that the next stage, once that um, once that legislation has gone through, is um, that there will be a, a consultation to look at the scope of roles that are required the the qualifications that fall in scope all of those aspects so that's still to be agreed but we'll change the the landscape a little bit in terms of qualifications and training in the sector i think it will it will help to embed a culture of of professional development through through the sector from that point of view which will be which is a good thing and i think is welcomed um broadly speaking by everybody um, the third area that su supports professionalism from our point of view is CPD. So um, it's it's great doing a qualification, doing some training, developing your skills, knowledge and your behaviours. But then how do you keep that up to date? How do you make sure you're reflecting current practice, that you're keeping up to date with all the changes in technology we've talked about, et cetera, et cetera. So that's as, that's as a key part as well as maintaining professionalism. And then the fourth area um, we would see is 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 the kind of putting your head above the parapet picture where you you understand your own role, where you fit within the organisation, but also where your organisation fits within the sector more broadly. Opportunities for networking, sharing best practice, etc. Getting involved in things like mentoring, um, going to events, conferences to share all of that best practice. 
So in a nutshell, that's that's the sort of um, how we would see the, the a professional member or professional member of staff being defined. So from an individual point of view, it's really then thinking about um, what what this means in practice. Um, so there are some elements to think about really in terms of who you are, where you are in your career, what where you want to get to, what your aspirations are, where you work within within the organisation, because there's a huge range of different areas within housing organisations. And what you want to do. So do you want to develop your knowledge and skills, maintain that knowledge, demonstrate your professionalism and your behaviours, develop expertise and develop your network, et cetera, et cetera. So thinking about all of those aspects. And then I know some individuals and some organisations are then sort of plotting that, if you like. There's a lot of information on this slide, so I apologise, but we can probably make them available to you. Um, plotting that to sort of show the specific activities and, and development activities that you could do as part of your ongoing career at the point you are now, but also at the point going forward. Um, building in that flexibility to do lots of different sorts of things so that they can fit into um, into the sort of work-life balance that we're trying to achieve here um, and have that flexibility. So qualification might be might be really suitable <clears throat> at one point in your career, but then at other points it might be about getting more involved in going to conferences and events and sharing practice, getting involved in and updating through policy news and blogs and that kind of thing. So I know some organisations are looking at this from a career development point of view for staff to have a, a framework like this in place, but it also from an individual point of view, it can be quite helpful to, to, to plot that out. So that's um that's the end of my um of my session. So hopefully, hopefully that was helpful to to set the scene a little bit. Um so I'm now going to pass on to Sandra who's going to talk about her experience a bit more. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so just to support the theory, I guess, from what Sarah's talked about today, I'm going to talk about being a housing professional from a lived experience. Um, and what I really want to do today is advocate um, a, a career in housing because it is a career and it is a profession and just talk about how to look for opportunities um, in the workplace and outside of the workplace to enhance you as a professional um, and your organisation and the people you serve. So I've been a housing professional now for around 20 years and before that I worked in the health and um, fitness industry as a personal trainer I, one of my clients was a chief executive of the housing association and throughout our sessions we'd be chatting and she'd be telling me things and I'd be like wow this just sounds amazing so it really kind of got me curious um, as to what it was all about um, and I was self-employed at that time so um, and a single parent so I had to really have an income so I then looked into housing and I got a part-time job in supported housing. Absolutely loved it. From there, the health and fitness became my hobby, not my career. So I then pursued, um, purposely pursued a career in housing. I didn't fall into it. I pursued it. Um, and to do that, I just lapped up every opportunity to learn about the sector. And I think sometimes the sector can kind of mimic and it, it, it can look like it's a bit of an enigma to those outside of it. But if you get chatting to me, I'll tell you everything that I know about it because I love it. I love talking about it. Um, and also about the amazing people who work in the sector. But further to that, what really kind of gets me going each and every day is the real privilege that we've got to share the lives of the people we serve. We get invited into homes, we get invited to share memories. I mean, not many professions do that. So that's what kind of keeps me going. Um, so I said I purposely pursued a career. So just before I went on maternity leave with my last child, I applied to do the um, degree in housing and I was accepted. And I guess that just gives a sense of the culture of the organisation that I worked for. Um, I mean, not that I had time to be studying whilst looking after a young baby, but I did find time. 
And through um, achieving my degree, I also got my chartered membership with the CIH. Um, and but just was really keen to learn more and more um, about the sector. Excuse me, I've got a bit of a dry cough. About the sector and how, how can I be the best housing professional that I can be? Um, and I guess for me, it's looking for opportunities in your organisation. Don't wait for somebody to come and, you know, say to you, uh, are you interested or look for them, you know, know how to ask the right questions, know about your own journey. I took real responsibility for my journey um, and my development. And I think as well, it's also really useful to explore areas where you want to learn more, but not necessarily be an expert in. So for me, I was really interested in governance and I wanted to know more and more about it. So I saw a role advertised with the Professional Standards Committee um, with the CIH. I applied for that and I got that. And that has been a real kind of insight into governance because the uh, committee is, a dele is delegated within the CIH's government uh, governance structure. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I've looked for opportunities, not just inside my organisation, but outside of it. Um, I'd say I'm quite intentional about personal development. I, I don't see it as a, a, a passive interaction. I see it more of a, a, as an active one. I set myself um, goals for my development. So that could look like, you know, eight to 10 hours on an annual basis, one hour on a monthly basis. It could also be um, 15 minutes a week, five minutes a day. That could be through podcasts. Uh, finding quotes, reading, a whole range of things. So I'm, I'm always keen to learn more and more. Um, I'd say building your network is really, really important. Again, um, it doesn't just need to be in your organisation outside of it. Reach out to people. I'm always reaching out to random people. More often than not, people are more than happy to share their experience. Um, and just kind of going back on to the uh, professional development. So I'd done my degree. Um, I then set about uh, doing a postgraduate in management because I then got into management, uh, my first management role. Again, wanted to kind of strengthen not only my, my experience, but also the, the experience of those who I was working with. Um, from there, I then kind of got to a place where I thought, what's next? So I wanted to really use um, my experience and knowledge to date to then be able to kind of go to the next stage of my um, journey. I've just seen something in the chat. I will come back to that. Um, and throughout the, the, the years of collating my experience and my qualifications, I then set about applying for my fellowship. Uh, with the Chartered Institute of Housing. I then got my fellowship. And it's for me, it's just kind of outwardly saying, I'm a housing professional. I'm dedicated to the behaviours and the values of a housing professional. And I just want to really kind of really advocate that housing is a, just a fantastic career. But more than that, it's a profession. And I think we're at a kind of stage now where that's becoming really accepted and widely known. And I know recently with the government's announcement um, that, you know, people are really kind of taking on more and more responsibility um, in terms of that professionalism. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been really, really fortunate to work with some amazing people, learn from some amazing leaders. I work for a fantastic organisation who's very supportive of my personal development. And I would say, you know, for those who are looking to enhance and strengthen their career, I, I would just ask them questions, make it very clear what, what it is you, you want um, and, and go and look for the resources. You know, don't wait for somebody to do that for you. Go, go and look for, for that for yourself, really. Um, and I think, you know, I guess for me, where I am today, I never anticipated that there'd be all them things available to, to strengthen 
me as a professional within a housing kind of context. So I just kind of want to get it out there today. I'm not saying you need to do that, but what I'm saying is it's available should you want to kind of pursue that. And then finally, at the midpoint in my life, it seems like I never stop, but I've just recently embarked on an MBA. So <laughs> I just want to say, I'll always keep going. Even when I retire, I will still be learning and, you know, I'll still be quite curious. But I just want to kind of finish today by saying, you know, if you're in housing already, look for, for them opportunities for the learning. If you're not and you're thinking about it, more than happy for it for you to reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn, more than happy to have a chat. But it is it is the most fantastic career. I can't imagine doing anything else. And like I said earlier, there's not many professions where you get the opportunity to share people's lives in the way we do. So I just want to kind of finish there. And yeah, I know there's questions in the chat and more than happy to take any of them a bit later. But I'm going to finish off now and hand you over to Trish, um, who will talk a, a bit further about stuff Sarah and I've talked about. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Sandra. Um, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm just going to bring my slides up to share with you. So my name's Trish and I'm the Workplace Services Manager at Abbey, but I'm also the Vice Chair of the Professional Standards Committee. I have put a note in the chat to say um, with a link to um, who we are as a Professional Standards Committee. So if you want to know a little bit more, follow that link and uh, you'll find out a bit about us and what we do. So um, I've got some slides to share with you today. It's mostly pictures and I'll do some talking. Um, but I really hope that um, you enjoy what I'm going to share with you. And I've called it the Diary of a Housing Professional. So, as you have already Trish, heard... Sorry to interrupt your flow before yes. we get started. I think you just need to put it to presentation mode because it's coming up with a small slide and then you'll know. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, no. To make it fill the screen. Yeah, hang on one moment. As you know, I'm not an expert in this because I failed at the first hurdle with it, but... <laughs> Is that coming up all right now? It's well for me, unless it's different for anyone else, it's still coming up with a small slide and then the notes pages. Oh right, okay. It's not That's the end true. of the world. So don't worry. Okay. Don't. okay. Um is that helping at all? Yeah, no, we can well we can all see the notes. I don't know whether if you just press from yeah, the beginning. So. Okay. Like, click on the presentation slideshow from the beginning. OK, let's just try again. If not, don't worry. It's not the end of the world if we see. The notes yeah, no, it's it? fine. That's strange because it wasn't showing earlier, was it, when no. I did it? So I'll just stop sharing my screen again and let's okay. try see if it works this time. It wouldn't be an online session, would it, without at some point? Or well, someone say good, a tip. Yeah. Presenting Teams top right should work. Can you use PowerPoint oh. Live as an option? Yeah, we, we, we you wouldn't think we'd practice all of this before, would you? And as always, <laughs> it works in the practice and then not always when you do it. No, it says it won't work. OK. Should no I worry, see if we'll I can just... quickly get mine copy up? It's fine. Yeah. Um, OK. Unless, have you still got the notes screen now or is it gone? Uh, I think the notes is gone. It's gone? Oh, no, they're back again. Someone's saying you can look for you can look to hide presenter view, but Conscious, we don't want to lose too much time, so yeah. don't worry too much if it doesn't work. Okay, that's fine. Um, I don't the really know. The main thing is to hear what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah, so definitely. Uh, what I was going to say to you, would it be easier if you shared your screen, Rachel? Because you've got my slides, haven't you? Yeah, the only thing is then I won't be able to do any of the notes in the Teams, I realise. Right, okay, so yeah. I, will, I, can, I will. I'll have a go at doing it, Trish. Sarah, I'll have a go okay. at doing it. Oh my God, this Thank is teamwork. You. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, that's what it's all about, <laughs> if you, if you start, it? and I'll yeah. yes, have a go. We're, we're professional, yeah. just not as professional <laughs> as we want to be when it comes to the tech side. <laughs> well, you know, these things happen, don't they? So Absolutely. anyway, it's great to be here with you all today. Um, and 
You've already heard from Sandra and Sarah about how important housing qualifications are. And they're really like a kite mark you see on products you purchase. So if you think of like an electrical item, it's it's that mark of, of quality. And our frontline housing colleagues are supporting vulnerable people and dealing with complex situations on a day to day basis. And all housing colleagues regularly make these decisions um, which impact on the lives of customers. And a job in housing really requires a particular set of skills and knowledge. And so it's vital um, that those working in the sector work to acquire these and to keep them up to date. Sarah, have you managed to share the screen? I'm just working on it, Trish, if you can just can, if you continue, it should be there any second. <laughs> Fabulous, thank you. If when you uh, get to it, can you um, go to slide three, please? That work okay. there? Yeah, that's perfect. So I've just been through uh, the second slide. If you, That's it, perfect. But qualifications are only one chapter and they're only good as the other chapters in your story. So it's how you use it and apply it. Um, so including the need to display the right attitudes, behaviours and values. So I thought I'd share one of those chapters from you today um, from one of my chapters and it's called Walk In. We can go to the next slide. So I'd love to see a show of hands um, using the emojis. Do any of you enjoy walking? Fab. Fantastic. So we've got like 13 people there. Fantastic. And so here's a picture of my five month old Cocker Spaniel, uh, Teddy, and I walking along the Monster Trail in the Peak District at Easter. I started walking three years ago for my well-being and on one of my walks I was reflecting on my level four search qualification that I was studying at the time and I was thinking about Octavia Hill's famous quote where she talks about the need for quiet, the need for air and the sight of the sky and on several occasions I kept seeing geese and I noticed their formation when they flew and heard their call to one another which really got me intrigued and after reading up about them I noticed they had some similarities to how we empower one another collaborate offer support and recognize each other so today I'd like to share this with you next slide please so sharing a common goal so you might not know this but as each goose flaps its wings it creates uplift and by flying in a v formation the whole flock can fly 70 percent further than if each bird flew alone the one value that drives us all as a collective is connection and shared goals harness the power of each person's perspective needs and expertise to create a clear path towards a common goal and we know if we work if we achieve together we can go further than doing it alone and we know that with hybrid working some of those barriers can be in place that Sarah talked about where people don't feel part of a community so something I'd like to say to you today is how can you start to build your community and when you're working on a project or leading a team how can you get alongside your colleagues to engage early next slide please and then geese fly in a V formation. So you've probably seen them in the sky when you've been out walking. And flying in that V formation increases the visibility as every goose can see what's happening in front of them. So do we as housing colleagues take enough time to look up and look out? And by this, I mean connecting with colleagues across the sector, looking at the forecast trends and issues and having a future focus. And dare I say it, looking outside of the housing sector too. If you are, that's great, but how are you sharing your knowledge with others in your teams so that everyone has a view of what's coming on the horizon? Next slide, please. I remember a time in my career when I was asked to step into a service manager post and I'd only been a team leader for 12 months. Straight away, I put my hand up and said, no problem, I'll give this a go. But I knew in the pit of my stomach, I felt completely out of my comfort zone. I called my mentor and she said to me, 
don't borrow drama from the future, stop worrying. I can't tell you how powerful those words were. I turned my thinking around and viewed it as a growth moment. I said to myself, good things don't happen to you in your comfort zone. You have to step out and take risks. And sometimes the page of your book may turn quickly than you anticipate. Where do you want to be in five years? And what can you do now to equip yourselves with the right skills to get ahead of the curve? Next slide, please. I'm sure we've all been asked to work on a task and suddenly the remit changes. Sometimes we're often faced with the dilemma that we don't have the knowledge, expertise or have competing priorities. At this point, it's good to recognise how far you can take it. So I always think to myself, perhaps I'm missing something and who would be best to take this to the next stage? So when the geese, when geese are in this situation, and someone gets tired, one rotates back into the formation and then allows another goose to take the leadership position. So knowing how far you can take something and pass on is a crucial skill to prevent a task from stalling. If you had to pass something on to another colleague, do you know each other's strengths? Do you know who you'd go to? One thing that we have at Abri is our CIH club. It's developed together and it's for our colleagues. We support one another through qualifications. We have guest speakers in that come and share their knowledge with us and what's going on in the sector. And we also take time to share our knowledge between each other too. Next slide. So when a goose gets sick or wounded, two geese drop out of formation or follow it down to help and protect it. They stay with it until it is able to fly again. Someone once said to me, what is the greatest gift another human has given to you? And my answer was time. I was then asked about a moment that has had the most profound impact on my work life. And my answer was my mentor. If we think of a house build, it's easy to get stuck choosing all the different elements or feel at a loss how to make the next move. My mentor helped me to reflect on what I'm good at, because let's face it, we usually focus on the negatives. We looked at the kind of work I enjoy and they helped me to make a plan to get more of the things I enjoy into my working life, give me the confidence to make changes and help keep me on track. It's also been a great way for me to access a wider network and they'll be honest, objective and far enough from the situation to both help me see the things I'm doing well and recognise where I can improve. And I can't tell you how thankful I am to my mentor for giving me their time. And if you're interested in having a mentor, CIH have a mentoring platform, which you can find out more about on the website. Next page, please. Recognising great work. So you've probably heard if you've seen the geese in the in the sky flying together, they, they make this honking noise. And the honking noise is to recognise each other and to encourage each other along. And sometimes recognition can be overlooked or seen as the nice thing to do. But have you ever considered that at any time you recognise someone for doing something well or providing some constructive feedback, you are also improving your relationship with the colleague? Next slide, please. Jim Rowan famously said, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So I want you to imagine there's a table with five seats around it. Who are the five people in the chairs that you would invite? Do these people give you support, space to be you and personalities to help you grow? And then have a think about who can you bring into your life to support you and how can you connect with them? And really take that time to find your army of mentors from all walks of life. Next slide, please. So I'd like to end my session today by saying that housing is a great place to work. And my challenge to you is to honk, share your chapters, act as ambassadors for the wider profession by sharing the positive impact you make on individuals and communities. Share that common goal 
seek help, empower others, offer support, increase your visibility and recognise great work. I'm proud to be a housing professional, a sentiment that I'm sure will be echoed across this call today. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Trisha, and to our brilliant speakers, Sarah and Sandra as well. Um, I'm sure you'll agree that was a really inspiring run through of what it means to be a professional woman working in housing. And uh, it's been great to see all the stuff coming through in the chat as people have been helping each other out with the responses to the uh, to some of the things that have come up. So lots, lots and lots of plugs there for um, CIH. And I promise this is meant, isn't meant to be a complete plug for Chart Institute of Housing, but of course we're co-hosting. So uh, we're, we're very happy to plug it and uh, obviously believe it's a really important uh, organisation with lots of great resources. But um, with the Women's Housing Forum, hat on um, really I think it's a great opportunity to come together isn't it and think about what can we do to support each other in our professional development and uh, really inspiring to hear from Sandra with that particularly personal perspective about that kind of purposeful career development choosing to enter the sector and then really consciously thinking proactively about how to keep improving um, right through to the latest development of an MBA and my sense is that you will never retire Sandra so I'm sure you will continue to do lots in the world of housing uh, for many more years and um, if, if you'd like to ask a question now whether that's in the chat for us to read out or uh, stick your hand up and come on and ask it please do um, and uh, we've got about 10 to 15 minutes left for that. And lots of questions as well about some of the resources that were mentioned in the follow up email when I uh, share the recording. We can also share Sarah's slides from the beginning, which had lots of useful clips, uh, links in uh, and the various links that we've been sharing around uh, membership and resources and mentoring uh, and all of that. One of the questions I was going to ask, but I think the, the, the uh, panel members have, have answered it so well already is, you know, what would you say to anyone thinking about a career in housing? Uh, uh, and uh, th that's been very well answered. But if I can invite Sarah, Sandra, and uh, Tricia to just uh, un, un what's the word? I can say unmute yourself. Take your put your cameras back on, um, and we can see you again. Brilliant. So you don't have to just look at me. Um, and I can see Tricia commenting as well. It's a really helpful reminder. There's also women in social housing group, which. Um, that uh, there's lots and lots of uh, opportunities to be getting involved in in all sorts of different networks. Uh, so great to share that, and I'll make sure that's all picked up in the follow-up email as well. I think we can't have enough of it. Um, so I can't see any questions coming through just yet, but um, Jill, I know you're in the background too, and uh, Jill's one of our regional managers uh, and has been doing a lot around professionalism too, so might well uh, have a question for us. But I wonder, Trish, just coming to your question around that, table that you talked about and that's a really interesting analogy around who are the people around your table to make sure that you've got the sort of support you need when you think about that question how do you how do you identify who those people are and then you know go out to seek make building that network in terms of any tips for people if you don't mind me putting yeah. you on the spot yeah no no not at all I think it's, it's a really great question and it's I think there's no right answer here really I think it's about understanding what you what you want from different people so if you're looking for a mentor for instance when you go onto the CIH website you actually put what um what you need support with and it and it matches you with an individual so that's a really great starter for 10. I also think it's about building communities uh, we talk in our organization about I think all housing associations talk about collaboration um constantly um, and we put all these fancy products in buildings to help us collaborate. But that isn't collaboration is just that byproduct of community. What we actually need to do is build community. So it's about getting to know people in your organisations and then signposting you to people as well. And also joining in with um, things that are going on outside of the sector. So um, we were really fortunate to go along to a DIN networking event last year and we went to Netflix and, and various places and we've built some great networks out of that. So I'd encourage people to really look and see what's going on in the sector as well. Thanks, Trish. Um, and Sandra, I don't know whether you want to add anything to that in terms of how you'd approach that. Don't worry if, if not. I appreciate um, putting you on the spot now. No, 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 that's fine. I, any opportunity to kind of advocate and encourage people into housing or to kind of enhance their career, I'm, I'm up for that. Um, I, I would say reach out, just reach out to organisations, ask if you can do some shadowing. Re 
you know, I reach out to people all the time on LinkedIn, random people as well, you know, and I've kind of had probably one person who hasn't come back to me out of 50, seriously, reach out to people, have a chat with them. What I would say, if you are going to do that, but, you know, be prepared, have the questions ready so you can kind of be, you know, quite focused on what it is you want to know. But yeah, do, do shadowing, reach out and, and ask people if you can. Yeah, that's a that's a great tip. And LinkedIn is brilliant for that, isn't it? And of course, it's free. So, um, and well, assuming you don't go for premium, it's open to anyone, isn't it? So apologies, I, there was a great question in the Q&A that I'd um, uh, missed because I'm not... <laughs> Not doing a very good job of chairing and looking across different uh, streams. So a, uh, a question on um, uh, mentoring and coaching uh, and a comment that it can be very powerful. Is there a particular network for women to access pro bono mentoring? Is that something that uh, exists? Because obviously I'm conscious we don't want this to be exclusive for people that aren't CIH members. So what what's out there that you've seen and you've found helpful? Thanks. I, I can I can kind of answer that question. So what what I didn't mention was I'm also a co-chair for Wish, uh, so women in social housing. Um, like again, if anybody's interested, reach out and I can put you in touch with people who would be more than happy to support you. Thanks, Sandra. Um, that's that's brilliant. We'll make sure uh, that we've got all these various links in. Now, Philippa, you asked a question about coaching that I said I'd seen, and then I think it was actually that question was from Zaba. So you've got your hand up. Brilliant. You're saving me having to scroll through. Um, now, let me find you um, because I don't think I can. I need to unmute you. So bear me one second and I will allow you to come on and ask your question. Thank you. You should now have the camera. Thanks for that, Rachel. Uh, yeah, I did. I asked the question because um, I've been a mentor for the CIH now for years. But a lot of the people that I have conversations with need more coaching than mentoring, because quite often you can be asked to um, work with someone who you haven't got any direct experience of, of their work environment. It's it's coaching that they need. Um I am a coach. I'm a coach for for my own organisation, and I just wondered if it's if it's something that the CIH is looking to offer alongside the mentoring program. I'm sure there are lots of coaches. I know Sandra, you'd be sticking your hand up. I know you would to offer that that for for people, particularly women who are looking to progress or move into other roles, maybe looking to work into more male orientated environments. I've come across a lot of that. A lot of women who want to go into the development and construction side of things. And I, I just wondered if, if CIH did have any plans to, to offer that, as well as the more traditional sort of mentoring. That's a brilliant question, Philippa. Sarah, if it's not putting you on the spot too much, can I come to you first for that one? And some of this, of course, we might follow up afterwards. We won't necessarily have all the information at our fingertips now. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I think it's a really good, really good shout, Philippa. I mean, we have the mentoring um offer that we have is really successful and uh, we've got a really good platform to support it now so it's very straightforward for people to meet each other and um and build those relationships so coaching of as you've as you've rightly said is a is a different a different thing and it might be more about introductions rather than actually sort of facilitating the process um but certainly i will take that away and investigate further because i think it's a really good a really good thought in terms of how we could we could help to facilitate that in the sector thank you well thank you brilliant thank you this is what these sessions are great for isn't it but helping to connect people and uh, ask ask those really important questions is there anyone else that would like to come on and, and ask a question like that i can see some brilliant stuff coming through in the chat that i appreciate people watching back on record won't see but lots of really um kind of constructive comments about the need for women in um, in roles right across the organisation, including at board level. I know that's something CIH is looking at in terms of building better boards and making sure that there's more diversity, you know, in terms of gender balance, but ethnicity uh, and all sorts there, because obviously, you know, we need to make sure we're representative of the, the people that we're working with. Um, and great to see some really positive comments through about people who'd be interested in, in getting involved with coaching and mentoring. Uh, and Jill's put a, um, 
a link in as well to National Careers Week, which has just been and gone, but will be coming round again quickly uh, in terms of organising. And I know uh, Jill's always looking for people who are happy to speak to that. So if there's anyone on the call that would like would be interested in working with us next year when we look at how we can spread the word of housing as a really positive career of choice, um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, now, I wonder whether Trish, Sarah or Sandra, there's anything else you would like to add, having seen some of the chat or the, you know, the observations coming through? Because uh, if not, conscious of time, we might let people have five minutes back of what I appreciate is probably lunch break uh, as well. If not, I will let to I wrap think up. Just one thing I would ha I would add, if, if there's one bit of advice I would give is, is not to associate your worth and value with job titles. Just mm. do a job you really love. And, and do it really well. That's that's what I would kind of end with from from my perspective. Yeah, that's a great tip. And I, I can see Trisha in the chat has just said she needs to go, but then she put a brilliant quote in, which you may or not hear me read out now. I thought it really sums up this topic. And it says the professionalism of the housing sector has never been as important as it is now. The role of frontline housing staff has changed so significantly in a post COVID world. Having the right value, skills and experiences are vital in delivering housing services. Uh, and I think that that really sums up a lot of what we've just been talking about there. So thank you so much to Sarah, Trish and Sandra and to all of the people who've really interactively, as much as you've been able to uh, join in as well on the session, because it's, it's really helped um, so much to cover. I think this could be a whole day event, really, couldn't it? Unpacking. We've really just been scratching the surface, but it's brilliant to hear so much enthusiasm for it. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things and I'll, as I say, I'll follow up with the recording with some of the links to the resources we've mentioned. Um, Women's Housing Forum will be back soon, I hope, with uh, another webinar that you can sign up to, um, but also a save the date for anyone who's interested and perhaps works around London or would be happy to travel. Um, we're looking at an in-person event on the 12th of June as we relaunch the forum. We've got some great speakers lined up and we'll have some interactive workshops and so lots of opportunity to be um, digging into some of the stuff that we've talked about today and, and lots of other things to do with housing. So I'll drop the links in the, um, the chat now. Um, and, uh, and in the email for those who are watching on record that think, no, that you're talking about because we can't see the chat. Um, so thank you so much, all of you. It's been brilliant to, to see you. Really appreciate your time. I know everyone's busy. So thanks for taking the time out. And uh, do follow up with us on email if you want to keep the conversation going. Um, all the very best. <laughs>